Hi, Dr. John Torres here on my Dr. Doc series, where every week I talk to an expert around the world about a variety of things related to the pandemic, related to coronavirus, and related to health in general, with the goal being trying to make sure that we get you information that you can use to help you, your family, your loved ones, and your community get through this pandemic sooner rather than later, keep as healthy as possible, and get you that information as soon as we can. And today, to help us with that, I'm very excited to have with us Dr. Julie Morita, right now she's the Executive Vice President of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but she was a former commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health and a former member of ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, who, as we sit here, Julie, they are meeting right now to decide what to recommend as far as booster shots for the Pfizer booster. So, what are, well, number one, thank you for being here with us, but what is, what's going through ACIP right now? What, what are they thinking about? What are they talking about? Hey, John, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so the, the ASAP is an advisory committee on immunization practices, and they're a 15 member committee made up of pediatricians, obstetricians, internal medicine doctors, family physicians, infectious disease experts, public health experts. The whole gamut, and, right? Yeah, the whole gamut. And they, they're volunteers, and they meet on a court, usually on a quarterly basis to review vaccine recommendations that have for children and for adults throughout the United States. And they base it on what FDA has actually approved. So usually it's a licensed vaccine. Has a vaccine been licensed to be used in the United States? And what are the recommendations to who should get it? When should they get it? Those kinds of questions are what the ACIP wrestles with. So with the recent COVID vaccine, having FDA just approved last night, the use of the Pfizer vaccine for booster doses, what they're doing right now is going through the data. I mean, while well, they're discussing the data, they've had access to the data. I've been thinking about these data for a while now to understand, to take the FDA's approval for use of this vaccine and now make firm recommendations for how they can be used within the United States population. So FDA approved the vaccines for use for people who are 65 and older for people who have underlying health conditions that make them higher risk for serious health outcomes because of COVID infections and people who work in places that would make them at higher risk for serious outcomes as well. And so now CDC has to make those, ACIP has to make recommendations regarding how to do that, who these subgroups are, how to prioritize within those groups. So that it's clear that doctors in the clinics and the hospitals throughout the U.S. know how to administer the vaccine. Now, let me see if this is too simplified, because sometimes what I say is the FDA, their job through their advisory committee and then their, their own uh, approval or authorization process through their job is to tell us it's safe and effective. And then the CDC's job through ASIP and then the CDC is to tell us how to give it, who to give it to and when to give it to them. Yeah, that's not an oversimplification. That's exactly what we would do. So I can remember waiting for FDA's approval of, these, of vaccines, like the HPV vaccine or the meningococcal vaccines, so making sure that they were safe, they were effective. We would look at those data as well, but then turn the approval into on the ground kind of recommendations so that doctors and nurses know how to administer the vaccines and who to give it to. And Julie, one of the things the FDA did, which uh, the White House back in August said they want everybody to get vaccines boosters by the eight month point starting September 20th, which was a few days ago. Well, the, F, the, the FDA looked at that through their advisory com committee and they said, you know, we're not sure everybody needs them that's had a vaccine. In this case, like you mentioned, 65 and above, those with pre-existing conditions that can put them at higher risk, those with occupations that put them at higher risk of contacting COVID. Um, can the CDC go around that and make it more restrictive or less restrictive? Or are they pretty much what the FDA said, they're focusing on that and they go with that decision? So yeah, typically what happens with the ACIP is they will look at the guidance or the, the approvals that come from FDA and then work within those boundaries because that's what the vaccines are approved, how, how they're approved to be used. And so sometimes there may be a, a, a more narrow recommendation than what FDA approves a vaccine for, but it's not usually a broader recommendation than what FDA actually does. And that makes sense and nothing personal, but I tell people all the time, if you're very sciencey, it's a great meeting to listen in on because you have these world's experts just are debating back and forth. But if you're not sciencey, you're gonna get lost in, <laughs> in what they're talking about. But the, uh, you know, we always talk about our system being kind of the gold standard for the world as far as making sure our medicines are safe. Is that because of this, you know, essentially, and I was talking last night on NBC News Now with Alison Morris, and she basically put it down. I thought she put it great. This is a, essentially a four-step process. And right now we're on step number three. 
Is that why th th this is such a good process? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at all the childhood vaccines that we administer to our kids on a regular basis, if you have kids, you know, and you take your children in for their two month visit, their four month visit, their six month visit, they're getting vac numerous vaccines, many simultaneously. And they're all, they have all gone through this rigorous process of approval. And that's what gives us confidence, should give us confidence in what's happening with the COVID vaccines that we're using that same approach to really have this rigorous review of the data and the evidence to inform what's approved and then also what's what's recommended and how they're actually to be used. So I was so I felt so fortunate to have been an ACIP member a few years back and having been part of that process I realized how rigorous um, they how rigorous this, the methods are and and it only reinforced the confidence that I had when vaccine recommendations were coming out from CDC because I had confidence and faith in all the all the review of data, the commitment of the people who were involved on the committees, and, and who are really volunteers uh, doing doing it because they really want to do what's right for public health. You know, it's interesting listening to the in on the debate that's going on yesterday and today over these last couple of days, and part of the process and part of the debate is. The confusion this might lend going forward because this is restricted to people who got the Pfizer vaccine and to only certain populations that got it. So other people are gonna be saying, you know, what about me? I, I had the Moderna, I had the Johnson & Johnson. Are those coming down the pipeline? Yeah, so John, I think if, not, if COVID has taught us nothing else, it's really taught us that our public health recommendations and guidance is often interim, that they're based on what information is available at a particular moment in time but that those recommendations will often evolve. So as it relates to mask wearing, as it relates to treatment, as it relates to social distancing, as it relates to other vaccine use. In the past year and a half, we've seen these recommendations evolve and change and be customized based on available data, science and evidence that really push us in different directions. So J&J &J vaccine information regarding booster doses, Moderna vaccine uh, information regarding booster doses will become available. They will go through the FDA process, they will go through the ACIP process, and then the recommendations will be made when the data are there. Why are these groups so important that they focused in on? We, I think everybody understands the 65 plus because they're higher risk for complications, but the healthcare workers in particular, essential workers, why are they, is it important that they get these boosters early on? So I think what we're looking at, the point of the boosters is really to prevent serious disease, hospitalization and death. And so when you think about who's at greater risk for hospitalization or death because of COVID infections, we know the elderly are definitely at higher risk. We also know that certain people who are at, um, have underlying health conditions are also at higher risk. And then because of occupational exposure, people are at greater risk also for getting sick, perhaps spreading the disease to people who are higher risk as well, or they themselves may be higher risk. So it's really a matter of prioritizing um, based on prevention of serious disease hospitalization and death. And is it also trying to make sure that, you know, healthcare workers in particular, that they're still there to do the job? Because if they get sick, who's going to be taking care of the patients? Who's going to be taking care of them? There, yeah, I mean, there is, that is a factor as well, that we know that if you look at a nursing home, for example, that population of people living in a nursing home are incredibly high risk for dying or for being hospitalized because of infection from COVID. But, and if you vaccinate all of them, that's great. But if their healthcare workers who are caring for them are unvaccinated and they get sick, they are definitely able to, they could spread it to the um, people that are in the nursing home as well. And they also could be taken out of the workforce, in which case those people can't get the care that they actually need. And Julie, one of the other things ASIP was talking about over the last day and a half is mixing and matching. And they're saying, you know, we need at some point to understand mixing and matching what happens. Where are we right now with that? Because they have been saying, you know, that there's data, that they're getting at the data, they're looking at the data, but it's not quite there yet. So do you think that'll happen eventually? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think what, when we know with other vaccines that we have for the childhood or for adult uh, immunizations that are routine, we can mix and match products. Uh, and uh, but that's based on uh, studies that have shown that that is an effective approach. We don't have the data at this point regarding mixing and matching Pfizer, Moderna, J&J &J vaccines. And so until we have those recommendations or the data to support the recommendations, it's better to stick with the same, uh, the same uh, vaccine product. However, there are some people who don't know or who have lost records of it. And if that's the case, then they should get what's available. And the data they're talking about, do you think that's something that's going to happen in the next month, in the next two months, in the next six months? Is it sooner rather than later, or is it later rather than sooner, do you think? 
And the reason I'm asking this is because the reason I'm asking is because people are sitting here going, you know, this gets kind of confusing, and especially once we get, you know, down the line where Moderna and Johnson and Johnson have come out with the vaccines. And all of a sudden it's going to be like, okay, I have to remember what I got. I have to go to a site that has the one I want you know, or one I need, you know, mixing and matching obviously would make it less confusing and easier. Yeah, what I'm hearing about being more available uh, in the short term is more uh, information regarding the need for a booster dose for Moderna, a need for booster dose for J&J vaccines, and also pediatric vaccines. Are the vaccines going to be licensed or approved for use and recommended for children 5 to 11 years of age? Are they going to be approved and, and recommended for children 6 months to uh, four year, through 4 years of age? Those are the things that we're hearing about coming more soon or uh, in the near term versus the questions of mixing and matching. I haven't heard a good time frame for that. And speaking of pediatrics and uh, pe children, you're a pediatrician by trade. Uh, we were always told in medical school by pediatricians, you know, children are not just young adults. In other words, their immune systems act a little bit differently, their bodies act differently, their physiology. So you can't just take the dose and say, ah, let's give them half a dose. And in this case, with Pfizer, they decided on a third of a dose based on the safety and the effectiveness profile. Um, that should be happening by Halloween, they think. That's the time frame. Do you agree with that time frame? Well, if the, so the Pfizer has um, asked FDA to approve their vaccine for use or will be asking for FDA to approve um, uh, their, their vaccine for children five to 11 years of age. Usually when that happens, it, takes, it took them about a month to do the same kind of evaluation for older children. And so it's possible the vaccine could be approved by later next month. So Halloween around Halloween is a possibility, is a decent possibility. I think it's really important, again, what we, FDA has not reviewed the data yet. Uh, they need some time to do that. And we want to make sure they have the time that they need to really evaluate the data carefully, thoughtfully, thoroughly to make sure that the vaccines are um, safe and that they're also effective. And so um, we'll look for, I want FDA to have all the time that they need to actually do this thoroughly and carefully. Uh, and once they make the approval, then uh, hoping the ACIP will act quickly then to make recommendations. And again, we always talk about that, Julie, the you know, children aren't small adults, things act differently on them. So they have to fine tune it a little bit differently than they do with adults the way they do the human trials. But what exactly do we mean by that, that they're not just small adults? So I think when we, I think you gave a great example, John, that we don't, we can't just give the same dose of a vaccine to a 50 year old person or, or, or and, and then turn around and give it to a four year old child because our immune systems are at different strengths. As you age, your immune responses aren't as strong. So if we gave the same dose to a young child, they could have much more severe side effects or reactions to the vaccines overall. And so we really have to think about them as uh, separate and different than just the same and smaller. And so adjusting the doses is really based on their how their immune systems react to certain diseases. I mean, it's another example of it is when you look at how people, children have responded to COVID infections themselves. Although children have been getting sick because of COVID, they haven't gotten as seriously sick as adults and as particularly older people. Uh, but then when we look at um, the Delta variant, we can see that this last wave of COVID has resulted in many more children being hospitalized and many more children getting seriously sick. And so we can't treat all people um, of all ages exactly the same way. We really are different. And when it comes to health equity, you know, one of the big issues has always been trying to get it into the communities of color, the disadvantaged communities. And there's been a lot of headway in that. And there's been a lot of, you know, getting down to those community leaders and trying to convince them, because I know where I come from, if the priest or the community leader says you should get this, everybody's going to get it. If they say, I, I wouldn't think about getting it, then nobody's going to get it. So it's very important that you work with that person. And I think we've made good headways. Is that going to be another battle with boosters? So, yeah, I think it's, um, we've experienced vaccine uh, problems with vaccine access, as well as uh, people questioning, having questions about the safety and efficacy of the vaccines. And so it's, it's critical when we look at who's most affected by the disease. And we know that communities of color, we know low income communities, we know that rural communities have really been hit hard by the pandemic and people, uh, communities of color in particular have ended up with higher rates of hospitalization and death. We really need to make sure that we're making sure the vaccines are highly accessible to them so that they're available after hours, on weekends, so that people who uh, 
can't take time off from work, can actually get access to the vaccines. That's a critical component in terms of addressing um, health inequities. In addition to that, making sure that we're able to communicate effectively the benefits of the vaccine, the safety of the vaccine from trusted messengers. So you brought up ministers or community leaders who are trusted leaders and how they can have a huge impact on people's acceptance of the vaccine. And that is critical. So all those systems that have been in place right now to help adults get vaccinated need to be continued and strengthened to focus on the children. I mean, I think one of the key things we know is that but when parents are vaccinated, their children are much more likely to be vaccinated. So we still have some time to focus on getting all the parents vaccinated. So when the childhood vaccine is available, we can make sure that the children are vaccinated as well. And is it the opposite too? If parents are not vaccinated, then it's less likely children won't get vaccinated or more likely they won't get vaccinated? I think that remains to be seen, but I think we all keep our fingers crossed that we're able to get as many of the adults who are unvaccinated vaccinated. We know how effective the vaccines that if you don't get the unvaccinated are much more likely to be hospitalized, are much more likely to die and much more likely to get sick. So for people who are unvaccinated, the parents that are unvaccinated, we have some time and we really need to focus on getting them vaccinated while we're ramping up a boosters uh, program and also getting ready for our children. Excellent. Yeah, Julie, this has been wonderful. I have one final question, and that's the question I ask everybody at the end of this doc to doc. What's your bottom line to people listening here, especially a bottom line that can give them a little bit of hope as we you know, had still go through this pandemic? I think we, it's, it's clear through this pandemic that um, we have learned a lot. And, and it's really important to stick with the things that we've learned already. We know what it takes to really minimize the impact of COVID social distancing, mask wearing, good hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, getting vaccinated. These things really, really work and can minimize the impact of COVID disease. And so really it's a matter of us staying disciplined, keeping the faith that if we do these things that ultimately we will end this pandemic. And I think right now, the key thing from my perspective is we know the vaccines work and people who can get vaccinated really need to get vaccinated so we can protect those people who can't get vaccinated. Again, Dr. Julie Morita, thank you very much. The Executive Vice President of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a former ACIP member as well, and they are meeting right now. And we thought maybe they'd make a decision while we were talking, but they haven't quite made the decision yet, but we think they're going to go ahead and come up with the recommendations today. And then hopefully people who need booster shots can go out there and get them starting shots in arms tomorrow. But Julie, thank you so much for being here with us. I appreciate your time and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks a lot, Sean. Nice joining you.